Nightline is brought to you by the Dever Team, your source for New Smyrna Beach real estate and everything else New Smyrna Beach. Go to www.thedeverteam.com and call UCF alumni Travis Dever for all your New Smyrna Beach needs. 386-690-1636. That's 386-690-1636. Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. All right, hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley coming to you from the 1148 Studios, and this is Nightline 239 from the award winning Sports Network. Joining me as the new always, Roger Phipps. And on this week's show, we have the penalty box. Best performers, offense, defense, pole position, by the numbers, Roger's five alarm hot take, inside the huddle with Kyle Israel, making the grade, and your questions in Ask Nightline. All righty. Well, this was quite the weekend. Uh, I don't like to uh, report on this at all, but a 26-34 loss to Tulsa. Uh, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, uh, this was not what we needed. This was not what we expected. Uh, and our record against Tulsa is extremely bad right now. Uh, Nine and three in their favor. Yeah, that's not good. I don't care who it is. And for them to come in to our house and do it, and for uh, for them to break our our streak uh, in our house is broke not two good. Two streaks. Well, yes, broke two streaks, but broke the the most important one. I think was the uh, the thirty or whatever point uh, thirty. Uh, whatever games at home. I don't remember what it was. It was 20, 21, 21. 21 yes. Yep, yep. Second only to Clemson up to this point. Right. So that was the big one. As far as I'm concerned, uh, that I, well, Andrew, while, while you're saying that though, I mean, uh, there were 8,000 or so people that were announced in the stands. How much of a difference do you think that was? Is this a mulligan because there were only 8,000 and not the typical 50,000 that we would normally have? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I don't think that you can, uh, everywhere that these players have gone, there have, hasn't been nearly as many fans as there usually is. Uh, so I don't think that's an excuse at all. I mean, because the the crowd, yes, they, they will the players a little bit, but the players still have to go out there and, and play. You know what I'm saying? No, I do. But I also know it's a lot harder to play, and 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 you know this from defensively. You always want your uh, fans to be in the stands uh, because they're they're stopping them from communicating. And it's a lot harder to play, and I, and obviously you're playing the the twelfth man or whatever when you're in a stadium, and the bounce house gets loud. I mean, if it's one thing we all know, everyone who's ever attended a game there. Or if you watch on TV, so the Cincinnati game was a perfect example when they have plenty of mics in the stadium. It gets really, really loud, and it's tough to play for the offense when that happens. I mean, you might get a false start penalty. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, sorry, you had to mention had to false start penalties, didn't you? That was another problem again this week. <laughs> Oh boy, uh, where do we go with that? Uh, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about all these these false start penalties. I, I mean, it's just it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, <sighs> well, for me, I mean, when I'm thinking about this, right, I, I've got a. What frustrates me is I don't know where or why this is happening. I mean, last week we heard ECU had uh, was calling cadences and doing things to disrupt the offensive line, which, as we later found out, uh, or at least I read, uh, I don't know if you read this or not, but you were correct, that is a penalty that's enforceable with a five-yard uh, penalty every time that that happens. So technically, those refs for that entire first quarter last week should have been throwing a flag and uh, they should have been penalized five yards every time they pulled that. Now this week, 
whole different situation. Um, you know, I kind of gave the guys a pass because they were they settled down after the Well, do the we first know if quarter. Tulsa was doing it as well since they saw how well it worked for ECU? That's have what I no kept, idea. Yeah, that's what I kept thinking. I'm like, man, are they doing the same thing ECU did, or was this just a complete meltdown by our offensive line? You know, I wouldn't doubt it. Philip Montgomery is a you know, say what you will about him, uh, and he certainly would have been on the hot seat last year uh, had it not been for his victory uh, against us last year. But he is a very thorough and methodical coach, and especially when it comes to the defense. So I wouldn't put it past him to have thought about that and done that. Yeah. But that's pure speculation at this point. We don't know yet. Uh, last uh, last week, we were able to confirm a little bit later with uh, some of the players' family members and some of the players themselves. This week, uh, I don't think anybody was in the mood to talk about it and was just, you know, obviously uh, deflated and embarrassed, uh, for lack of a better term. Right. Well, there's a lot of people uh, really that are not on the hype train anymore. I mean, are, are you one of those guys that uh... – is is just kind of done with Coach Heupel, and and there's uh, there's quite a few people on Twitter and everything else saying that he should be fired. We've done our we've had our Heupel experiment. This is it, you know. He can't hold on to the team. He doesn't know what he's doing as a coach. All that stuff. Are you one of those people? No, uh, I, and I'm not either. Yeah, there's no way on God's green earth that you take a Knights fans. Do you not remember 2015? Because I remember it vividly. And I remember you, Andrew, trying to talk about it for an entire season. And um, when you think about that, you have someone who's lost, what, now four games or five games? So when I talk, when when Trace and I talked about that season, were we saying every week that they we should fire George O'Leary? No. I didn't think so. Nope. But, but uh, people have to some... remember that uh, Heupel is 24 and 5. Yeah. 24 and 5. He's lost five games. He's won 24. You don't fire a coach that has a 24 and 5 record. I don't and care who of... you are. Alabama wouldn't do it. Clemson wouldn't do it. Ohio State wouldn't do it. The Knights are definitely not doing it. So we shouldn't even bring that up anymore. Now, if this turns into, uh, you know, 24 and 50, that's another story. Or if it turns into 24 and 24, that may be even a different story. But 24 and 5 is not when you fire a head coach. Uh, Plus, uh, he, he has a $10 million buyout. And we don't have the money, especially after this season, to be doing stuff like that. Uh, well, so I, it's just to your point, though, the bigger point, and you're right about the money situation, but 24 and five, um, I can think of at least six other AAC teams that would love to be at 24 and five there the, it, that just doesn't exist. And it's helped us build our brand. And the other part is, remember, one of those losses was to LSU um without Mackenzie Milton when he went down. So at the end of the day, when I look at this, I just feel like um, you've got a head coach who's 24 and five. He's continued the winning ways and success uh, that Frost had in 2017. And we are still consistently being looked at as a top brand. Now, do I think that, uh, and and do I have some opinions on, on how we could tweak things a little bit? And do I think there may be some challenges between him and the locker room? Uh, I do. Um, the But no way does this man deserve to be fired. Yeah. I just think it's crazy that people bring this up every time we lose a game. That's one of the very first things that comes up. But, Andrew, we're supposed to be undefeated all of the time. <laughs> It would be nice. I mean, that would, you know, it would be awesome if we were undefeated all the time. That's just not, uh, you know, it it doesn't turn out like that sometimes. Sometimes your team has a bad game. So far this year, we haven't had a bad game. Uh, We did last night. It was a really bad game. Uh, You know, and and we tend to lose these bad games when, you know, things don't, uh, we can't get things figured out. Should should there have been more changes on the sideline? Should there, I mean, should something have, have 
been changed as far as the way that the offense was running or something like that? I mean, that's another thing I've said. He, you know, or I've heard that uh, Coach Heupel doesn't make enough changes. Uh, you know, during the game, he can't come up with new plays. He only runs three plays. There's all these things that that people say, uh, and it's it's kind of confusing. And and I wonder sometimes. You know, I've said it a million times. I wonder how long these people have been football fans, uh, just because. I don't know. It, it, I'm well, extremely I mean, he, frustrated. I have had a bad, bad day because of this. I woke up in a huge funk. Uh, last night I was in a huge funk. I, I you know, went on the message boards and started reading what people are saying. I was on Twitter seeing what people were saying. And it gets a little crazy sometimes. I mean, this is 2020. It's social media. Everybody, you know, feels like all of a sudden they can say exactly what they feel and it has no repercussions whatsoever on social media. And, you know, it's it's the, I guess the times have changed as football fans as well. The times have changed as everything else. Uh, we have to deal with no fans in the stands. We have to deal with with all the other stuff uh, with the covid thing. And then social media has just become it's ugly. It's really, well, really ugly. You know, give yourself – it's an emotional game. We want fans to be emotionally engaged. But give yourself 24 to 48 hours to really think about what you're getting ready to say. That's just <laughs> my advice to anyone when they're leveraging social media. If you still feel that way uh, after 48 hours and you post it out there and you get roasted, then your point is probably wrong. But – you know, football or any sport is an emotional game when you play it. And also as fans, we want fans that are engaged. And since this was a big, big, big disappointment, because it, you know, it's not just the scope of this game that we're talking about. We're also talking about the rest of the season and in a broader scope as a, as a conversation around, uh, you know, actually achieving a possible playoff berth, however remote that was, or at least putting pressure on it. I think people are feeling, that as a loss because when expectations go up um you know you 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 have a bigger letdown so i I feel like that's a byproduct of that but my advice is after 24 to 48 hours if you still feel that way then you're probably thinking logically even though your point may be illogical (laughs) go ahead and post it and uh you know if you're getting roasted it's probably a bad take yeah well, I mean, we've all made our bad takes. We we all get emotional in this. Uh, I've learned a lot to you know take a little bit of a break, not to not to spout off. And I've had you know uh, right now about uh, from the game when it started, twenty four hours. Uh, I just you know I I think that. It's not as bad as it seems. Yes, we, we lost a game. We, we did not expect to lose a game. We didn't want to lose a game. But it is what it is, and we have to go forward. Uh, I was taught when I was playing football, when the game ends, you celebrate for a bit, and then you move on. This is what we need to do. We need to move on. Obviously, we're going to talk about it a little bit more on this show because we're just getting started, but... I think the players, uh, from what I've, I heard from the comments and, and things, they're moving on. And that's what Hypel really wants them to do every week is move on. Uh, I gotta... The only thing I'll add to that, though, Andrew, and, and I'm, I'm going to put this out as a PSA more than anything else. Do not, under any circumstances, personally attack uh, family members or uh, players, right? I can guarantee you those players feel bad enough and some of the behavior and shenanigans that happened as they were leaving the field shows how frustrated, angry, upset uh, they were. And I can tell you they feel it just as much as you. They don't need you to be threatening them, et cetera. So yeah. don't do that. The other thing is we need to remember these are kids that just graduated high school, most of them. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> it's just... They're not adults like we are, uh, even though a lot of us don't act like adults. I was going to say that's questionable based on some of the behavior. Exactly. Well, uh, yeah. So, I mean, we've been over this point a million times. Uh, So 
let's get to some of the uh, things from the press conference that people said. Let's hear what Josh Heupel had to say first off. <clears throat> Definitely not the, uh, the result that, uh, that we were um, looking for or wanting. I thought uh, defensively we came out and played really well early. You know, and, and offensively didn't handle, handle the elements uh, early as well as we needed to. Had some turnovers uh, that our defense got that we didn't take advantage of. Then you sputter in the second half, and, and uh, it turns into the game that, uh, that it did. Um, and, you know, the turnovers early in the second half, you know, hurt us uh, uh, and just putting our defense back on the field. And at the end of the day, um, just way too many uh, self-inflicted wounds and the turnovers and, and uh, the penalties. You play in a tight ball game, and eventually uh, that's going to flip to the to the wrong side that did tonight. All right, I will say that this audio is not good on these clips tonight, uh, but UCF is doing everything they can, I know, to uh, to make these available, and I appreciate that. Just the Zoom Zoom audio is just not good, so uh, we'll we'll deal with that as we go. I, I just apologize for the audio quality on a lot of this stuff. So you heard there from Coach Heupel, and uh, he obviously did not seem very happy with the way things went, Roger. Uh, well, I mean, look at the turnovers. You heard turnovers, 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 right? So one of the things that, that you know I'll kind of talk about a little bit later is we're still leading the country in turnovers. The problem that we're having is we're not taking advantage of them. Uh, and what I mean by that is, We've gotten a grand total of 27 points off of the turnovers. And this week, the turnovers were not advantageous for us in the sense that Tulsa was able to also have the exact same number of fumbles and interceptions. So, um, you know, I know I know he's talking about the turnovers, but for me, it was less about the turnovers and, and more about the lack of offensive efficiency. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can get into. Uh, later on. But uh, for me, you know, he he was not happy, obviously, nor should he be. Um, he didn't mention the penalties in that clip, um, you know, but turnovers are, are if you if you have a tight game. And, and the one point I do want to make penalties and turnovers, if you have a tight game, um, eventually it's going to flip on the wrong side of the coin. So our guys have to be a little more disciplined. They have to make sure that they're taking care of ball security, but also that that penalty side of the game, this is where, and we talked about this in weeks past, and Kyle talked about this as well, this is where it bit us. It was in a tight game. Yeah, and that's what he said, basically. So, All right, uh, one of the guys that uh, had a very, uh, I don't know what, what you would say, not a good game, uh, Matt Lee. Let's hear what Josh Heupel had to say about Matt Lee. He's disappointed. It hurts. Um, there's no one that it means more to wear the, the black and gold and wear the UCF logo on their uh, on their helmet than it does for for him. Uh, he's a prideful kid. Told him to keep his head up. And, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, we win and lose as a football team. You know, it starts with me. We got to be better. I got to be better. We'll come back and, and we'll uh, we'll get better together. Uh, we'll become tighter and uh, we'll get back to uh, to win some football games. Here. All right, this is one thing that I, I, I've always loved when coaches said, and I know that this was a thing at first that Coach, Coach Heupel did not say enough of, that this all comes back to me. It starts with me. We'll all get better starting with me. Uh, I, I think that that's a big deal when a coach says that, and I, and I think it's very appropriate. Although I will not blame everything on Coach Heupel. Here is what uh, Dylan Gabriel had to say about this. And I just think, you know, there's opportunities in the game that, you know, we obviously didn't take advantage of, but shoot, man, I put this one on me, man. I just got to be better keep you play. You know, we got to be able to execute on a high level, and, you know, it just shows if, if you don't do that, what happens. All right. I don't know if I completely can say that this was, was all on Dylan Gabriel as well. He puts it on himself, uh, but I, I don't necessarily agree with his statement. He he puts a lot of things on himself when you ask him about the way that he played. He'll talk about the rest of his teammates uh, most of the time when it's a good thing, but when it's a bad thing and you ask him about it, he'll say it's his fault. Uh, and, and I appreciate that from him. I think everybody does, but I do not think that him 
and his play was 100% responsible for this loss. I would agree with that sentiment. I mean, you have the one turnover that he had. Now, he was not, he was certainly not playing at the level that we had seen him play the last couple of weeks. But the whole team um, wasn't either. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it, if if you look at the numbers themselves, we still played well enough to win this game if we were just looking at the actual performance of the players. But there's other things that go along uh, with that as well when you're talking about, you know, again, penalties and other things that were not advantageous. But Dylan definitely was off. He was not his best self. Uh, and what he's shown that he's capable of being. That being said, the loss is not on him, but he's doing what's what leaders should do uh, as well for yeah. his team. Yeah. All right, here is what Josh Heupel uh, had to say about the energy of the team and in the stadium. Was the energy different? Yeah, but uh, our players knew that. It's been different the first two weeks. It was going to be different in this one, too. Uh, our kids understood that. As, as much as anything, you just can't make the mistakes that we made. Uh, turnovers and uh, penalties. You end up being in tight games and how you end up being on the wrong side of it. Listen, the uh, football team over there has played good football the last half of last season and, and uh, you know, played a good Oklahoma State team to 16-7 game, too. So we knew that we were playing a good football team. All right. Well, he acknowledges right there that uh, Tulsa is a pretty good team this year. And uh, I would say their defense uh, especially is, is extremely good. And it gave us a lot of problems uh, during this game. Obviously, there were I think they, they looked really big on the field. Number one, that was one of the biggest things that, that popped out on the TV to me when I was watching. And I did not go to the game. Uh, and I'm glad that I didn't go to the game with the rain and everything else. Uh, I, I rather would watch uh, these games on TV if, if the, I've said it before, if tailgating and every, all the rest of the stuff is not available to do uh, during the games and it's going to be weird. And I think that there was a lot of people uh, that didn't go to the game. But uh, I noticed on TV that they looked huge uh, compared to us. And normally we're one of the teams that looks really big compared to everybody else. So that was yeah. kind of interesting. That's definitely true. The defensive front uh, for them um, on the line, they were all 300 to 320 pounds at least. So kind of compare that to ECU last week that had 285. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a pretty big deal. And not only that, they were athletic. Um, you had some of the the D linemen and linebackers; they were chasing down Otis Anderson. So, if if you've got that plus size, that spells uh, trouble. And you know, the linebacking core their their um, their one linebacker was six four, two sixty five. Their uh, defensive backs were all six foot to six foot two. Um, so they had good size and big bodies. So we're used to out physicaling, uh, if that's a word, <laughs> something uh, like that, uh, you know, other teams and, and the way that we play, we drive for those one-on-one -on -one matchups. But when you've got good players, uh, with good size, you don't have a, a size advantage. You've got to beat them with speed. And you saw that with Jalen Robinson a little bit when he had his, uh, there was a corner on him that was six foot, six foot two, and he got behind the defense. So you've got to beat them with speed and you've got to get them out of position. And they were playing us very, very physically, just like they did last year. Uh, so did LSU when we played them. Uh, so, you know, that system, if you, if you're not getting people loose, the defensive linemen, if they're 300 to 320 pounds, eventually they're going to collapse the pocket. And and you saw that either impact uh, Dylan on the run or when he was passing the ball uh, down the field, there were a few times where he should have climbed the ladder and maybe ran, took off and run a little more than what he did. And he just sat on it a little too long. But they were blanketing our our receivers and, and the defensive linemen were able to get pressure as a, as a part of that. Yeah. Speaking of size differences, I'm seeing right now watching this uh, football game on TV, the Sunday night game. It's the Eagles versus the 49ers and Adrian Killens is on the field for the uh, the Eagles, Philadelphia Eagles. Yes. Uh, and yeah, he is in kind of a slot position. 
uh, but he's out there, and that's awesome. Playing on the roster, that's really, really cool to see him out there. So uh, a little bit of a different number for him. I believe he is 49 this year on their roster. So good to see him out there. Anyway, sorry, uh, I just got a little bit distracted by that and saw that. So uh, speaking of size as well, this is where I was actually going. Um, we used a little bit of size, uh, down in the goal line area to score a touchdown. Here is <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Josh Heupel on Cole's, uh, TD. There's something in our, in our heavy package there that, uh, we felt we could take advantage of something that we had worked and, and uh, Cole did a nice job. Our office line did a nice job on that play. All right. Well, it was kind of a short little clip there, but, uh, he was giving props to Cole. Uh, that was cool. I, I love those big packages like that. Uh, and, and I, after we tried a couple times, I was like, man, just, you know, they, they call it bone, I think is what Let's they go call bone. it. Yeah, they, that, I, thought, I said to someone, I think it was Ben, I texted, that was the, the bone plus edition because there was two of them back there in the backfield. It was kind of a little, like almost a wishbone deal that they did back there with, with two linemen. It could have gone either direction, one on each side. So that was kind of cool. Uh, also, uh, you mentioned it a little while ago, Roger. I'm going to go back to this clip. I wanted to get it in there before you mentioned it, but I'm going to get it in there after you mentioned it. Uh, Josh Heupel uh, talked about the turnovers on each side of the ball, and here's what he had to say. You know, the turnovers were huge early in the football game. We should have taken advantage of it more on the offensive side of it. You know, really in the first half, played great football, gave up the, the one play at the end of the half uh, to give them seven points. But other than that, really – didn't give much up of, uh, of anything. And, and uh, at the end of the day, um, all three phases of the game got to play together. And, you know, the turnover on the kickoff and, and um, we had one on our punt uh, return as well. At the end of the day, uh, we got to find a way to, to make a play to, to turn it in the right direction in all three phases of the game. Uh, but we got to play better complementary football. Okay, so there you go on the, uh, on the turnovers and, and making something happen off of those. One of the other things that happened in this game was a very strange call, as far as I'm concerned, on targeting. Uh, we talk a little bit more about, with Kyle Israel about this, so you'll hear a little bit more of our opinions on that and his opinion as well. But here's what Josh Heupel had to say on the Josias Cradle targeting call. The second offensive targeting call that I've had in my entire career. I'll go back and watch it. You know, it looked like the kid was a little bit out of balance and uh, trying to finish plus one at the end of the play. Huge momentum swing right there. You know what I mean? Just the situation that you're playing in. Unfortunately, it was a huge moment. Uh, Could have really got us back on track. And I think that that kind of, I felt emotionally like that may have sealed the deal for a lot of these players. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there were a few times where that happened. We'd start getting the running game going or get a big pass down the sideline, and then something, either a penalty or or something would happen um, where it, it would just kill the momentum. And even if it was settling, there were a few times we were on the goal line and ended up settling for field goals, one that was missed, one that was made. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this, the, again, anytime we play Tulsa, there's this weird vibe. And, and the thing that I was feeling the most was in the fourth quarter, I just didn't, when they panned on the sidelines or you looked around, their faces were drawn. They were not in the game. They weren't, they weren't hyping each other up. And like in the 2017 teams, you saw those guys, even when they were down to Memphis or anybody else, they were on the sideline hyping them up. I don't know what it is about Tulsa. Um, I don't know if it's because we've got a younger team this year, but they, they just, they had no energy on the sideline. You could see it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dylan Gabriel, you know, last week said something about, uh, how UCF was the number one team in Florida and someone asked him about that after the game as well. Obviously I, I believe in, you know, our guys and I got utmost confidence in every one of them inside the locker room. You know, but um, that's what you got to do. You got to prove it every week. And um, we didn't prove it this week. So, you know, it's next week. Got to move on, gotta get the mentals right, and then figure it out. All right, get the mentals right. I like that comment from him. Uh, got to move on. All right, uh, here's Otis Anderson after the game saying, this is not the coach's fault. This is the player's fault. I'm out. I don't think it was on the coach. It's on the players. 
we have the SU. We got so many uh, playmakers that one score games, stuff like that. We, we shouldn't lose. Um, no matter no matter what's called, we can call a basic play, and we should be able to house. We got players everywhere on the field that can make plays. So that's just on us. All right. Well, he says it's on on the players. So. I agree with him. I don't think that it's all on a coach. I do think that a coach maybe could do something a little bit different. Uh, and there's a lot of people that feel like that. Uh, but uh, you've heard two players say that it's on the players, basically. It was either on them or it's on the players, like uh, Otis Anderson just said there. Uh, here's what Otis Anderson had to say on all the penalties. it got to get set. Uh, that's really what it is trying to push the tempo so much that we're not we're not making sure that we're set. So it could be just one person that's just getting to the line and getting ready, but he's not ready for a second. So that, that pretty much causes the penalties that we can get. Are we trying to go too fast, Roger? Well, what's interesting about it, uh, the short answer is no. I don't think we're trying to go too fast. I, I think we can get there. I don't know if the difference is between six seconds or ten seconds, but the thing that – that people forget, and the average fan is not going to remember that was important in there, is by the rule, it's not about uh, a lineman, for example, getting back to the line, getting down, and then they snap the ball. They have to sit there for at least one second. So if Dylan is trying to watch the line, and that includes wide receivers. So you've heard recently that uh, a few wide receivers being called out last game and this game for not being set uh, set on on the line, so it's not necessarily that they're moving faster; they're just or too fast. They're just not waiting long enough. Uh, Dylan's not seeing that someone isn't quite in position, especially after being motioned or something like that. And then they're hiking the ball, and then there's a false start. So that's that's a lot of uh, when you see the receiver or something like that. Uh, a lot of it is not just movement on the line; it's not being set long enough. All right, got one more from Otis Anderson here on the Tulsa D. I think the second and third level did a great job of filling their gaps. They came, they fit the run very quickly. Uh, any any ball and belly, they were down quickly, even if it was a pass. So uh, I think that they might have had a couple of missed assignments before, but uh, they were flowing. They were flowing pretty hard. They kept the energy all night. All right, well, you heard it there. They kept the energy all night. Uh, so that's it for the clips. So we can move on from that. Uh, good stuff there, as always, and I appreciate UCF giving us access to that stuff. Definitely different times uh, this year as far as the way that that stuff is all happening. So I uh, really appreciate that. What's next, Roger? Where do we go from here? Well, uh, well, I don't know where we go from here, but what's next is by the numbers. So uh, I'm I'm drinking a little bit of Diet Mountain Dew to get myself energized because I don't want to feel uh, or sound too too down uh, when we're talking about these things. So I'm going to update a few numbers that we had um, that we've kind of been tracking, and then I'm also going to take a look at some different ones because I felt like this week and, and how things went, there were some other important things that I wanted to point out. So let's update our uh, game tracker. So we've got 42 uh, games that we've played, 37 wins. So obviously we don't have a, uh, a win for this week. Uh, we were at uh, 40 games at 30 plus points. So that is streak has now been broken unfortunately and we're going to have to reset that uh 26 5 26 500 yard plus game so we didn't quite hit hit 500 but we did hit 455 yards so i mean folks for an offense uh 455 yards is, is pretty solid um and the other big one for this week is this is the first week that we are out of the top 25 in 33 weeks. Now, now stop and think about that for a second. 33 weeks we've been ranked in the AP uh, top 25. I remember there was a time when not too long ago that it was really tough for us to get ranked. So 33 consecutive weeks. Um, if we play strong against Memphis, I have a feeling we'll be back in in that uh, in that poll in no time. So the next thing I wanted to point out is that we actually came into the game averaging 50 points a game, which was good for fourth, 646 yards, which was good for first in the nation. Um, 
and now um, we've we've obviously regressed. And when we start looking at the stats for this game, we can tell that we were nowhere near what our normal mark is. Uh, we've had 12 takeaways this year. So 12 times we've gotten turnovers and actually retained possession. So it's not just, okay, I forced a fumble, they recovered for a loss. But these are actually 12 possessions that we had, but we only had 27 points off of that. Now, if you think about that, that's three touchdowns and a field goal, right? So that's four possessions that we've actually scored on out of 12. That's below our average, as as I've mentioned last week, 52% of the time we were scoring on our possessions. So that's well below our average uh, versus the rest of our possessions that aren't off of turnovers. So there's something going on there that we need to work on. Obviously, this game, we turned the ball right back over to them uh, as soon as we did that. So, uh, But there's that's a stat to keep track of and look at because it, it does you no good to get turnovers if you're not scoring points off of it. Um, Otis Anderson actually had a decent day, uh, rushing the ball. He got going in the third uh, when basically what happened with that was they were rushing, um, and, and trying to blitz us at the very start of the game for the first quarter and most of the second, then they started dropping back into a three, four, four. So they actually changed schemes kind of, uh, in first half, the second half. So there was an adjustment there. And normally when that happens, you know, they're rushing the ball. We're trying to hit them over the top. Uh, this game, it was a little bit different because their cornerbacks and safeties did a great job bumping us off the line, and which didn't allow the plays to develop. Uh, and what ended up happening was the defensive linemen were getting pressure. So when you think about that, that's exactly what Randy Shannon is trying to do, is allowing folks to play man, rush more blitzers. And then in the second half, we started having a little bit of success. And in the second half, uh, we went to the run game. And that was because they slid more people out of the box. And, um, and the defenders were, were sitting back more in coverage um, than otherwise because they were, they were worried about our passing game. So, uh, you know, at the beginning of the game, it was also raining pretty heavily. And so that's obviously not a good thing for a passing game uh, as well. Um, but he had 80 yards on 18 carries. His average went down, but it still was not a bad game for him. Um, Marlon Williams, 388 yards, uh, so far is ranked number two in the country. Jalen Robinson, 366 yards is ranked number six. Now, the next thing I kind of took a look at was, uh, points scored by possession. So this is something I've been tracking. And as I just mentioned, it was 52% for our season, season average, which was more than last year, which was at 46%. Uh, so, we scored, we had 18 possessions. We only scored on four possessions in this game. So that's 22%. So that gives you an idea uh, of how many times we turn the ball over and or punted, which I've seen more of Mr. Osteen this game than any other game that we've played this year. Um, drives were longer. and We didn't move as quickly. Um, you know, we kind of talk about this a little bit with Kyle and we talked about it a little bit earlier at the beginning of the game. Uh, you didn't see us move at the speed that we're used to moving. Dylan was sitting back. He was actually trying to call protections because they were being so aggressive on the blitz. So when you see us go super fast and kind of sw switch tempo, it's usually when you're looking at zone coverages because then you can get them out, out of position, et cetera. If they're blitzing consistently, it doesn't make sense to do that because you, they'll get an overload blitz or something on you and overwhelm your of, offensive line. So at the beginning of the game, our average speed, we were getting down to 14, 16 seconds on the play clock versus what we were used to getting, which was anywhere between six and eight seconds. So that was a little bit interesting and also, I think, took us out of our rhythm. Uh, speaking of Dylan, he his completion percentage was way down over his average for this year. He was at 50 Four percent completion percentage versus 68 is what he had last week. So last week he went up from 64 to 68. This week he went to 54 percent, which is which was a huge, huge, huge difference because he was passing 51 times this week 
Last week, he passed for 53 times. So it's not just a function of how many times that he was actually able to pass uh, or that he was passing way more than he usually does. Um, it was just a matter of him passing the ball at a much worse uh, completion percentage than what he was doing before. Um, his average yards per pass also was down. So we weren't getting as many explosive plays uh, this game as we were in the past. You had that one run by Otis Anderson and a couple of catches by Jalen Robinson, but his average yard per pass was 6.5 yards per pass per pass versus 8.7. So that was uh that was obviously an indicator that those 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 plays were not as explosive. Additionally, his QBR QBR rating was down this week to 59.9 uh which was about 13% lower than it was last week. So uh that uh, 59 QBR is is not not really good. And PFF actually had the entire offense rated at 57, rated it as a 57, which is the worst mark that we've had since the Cure Bowl in 2016 wow. when we had 52. So that tells you how big of a difference it was this week over what our norms were. Yeah. Speaking on penalties, there were over 10 false starts. We had 18 for 124 which is actually less than what we had last week by <laughs> one. And uh, the, yardage, the yardage is a little bit different as well. However, that's another 124 yards. And through three games, we've lost 314 yards to, pen, uh, to penalties. In fact, we've been penalized 45 times, which is by far number one in uh, college football. That's crazy. That is way, way, way crazy. Um, as far as our our uh, our folks that were out, Parker Boudreaux was still out this game. What's interesting is uh, I, I actually think uh, Grant Richie Grant was knocked out uh, on the field, he so was. he went out. He for was a half. he was out cold. Uh, yeah, on the knee to the helmet. Yep, uh, right to the side of the head, and he was out cold, and that was the big thing there. Uh, I'm glad that they didn't uh, go too crazy and, and take him out on a stretcher and all that stuff. I didn't think that that was really necessary, but uh, he got up and actually walked off the field. So that's good for him. Well, we actually have an extra couple of weeks um, until Memphis. So that will help with concussion protocol because I'm sure he'll be going through that as well over the next couple of weeks after being knocked out like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing that can happen. It happens uh, pretty regularly. You just don't... Uh, you just don't see it as much. Uh, I, I think it may have happened to another guy, and I can't remember who uh, t this game as well. Uh, real quickly, though, he was he was up a lot quicker, but I think it happened to another guy as well. And it happens. It's just anytime you got a knee going that fast, especially from a running back, and it hits you in the side of the head, uh, even with the helmet on, you you, you know you, it's, it's the what knocks you out is the the, the motion of your your brain uh, against y your skull on the inside it moving uh in the cortex it happens all the time in in uh like MMA and stuff like that if you watch uh the UFC uh happens all the time and the guys are all right after a couple minutes most of the time so uh, th that's another thing, though, with the uh, targeting thing. Uh, we talk a lot about this with Kyle later, but uh, it's one of those things that they're trying to prevent. In this situation, I don't think it was preventable. It, it wasn't a, a thing that uh, that he could have helped. I don't think it just it just kind of happened. So yep, and uh, especially when you're hit right where that ear hole is. Yeah, uh, that's a, sp a very vulnerable place, yeah. uh, and especially with a knee. Um, last number I wanted to put out there, 8,874 reported in attendance with a little over 3,000 students, and that was in the rain. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we have a little more capacity, so um, it was a little lighter than what we were expecting, but it sounds like there was about 5,000 or so um, a little uh, regular fans in the stands as well as the students. Yeah. Uh, Pretty good. Um, uh, I, I think that that was a pretty good showing, though, uh, to be honest with you, because I know a lot of people were a little bit worried about going out there. A lot of people are still worried about the COVID issues. 
Uh, and then a lot of people just didn't want to do the games differently than they were. And they were quite expensive, the tickets to go out there as well uh, this season because of the way things are being done. So I, you know, looking at those numbers, I think that that's a pretty good showing for, for the way that things are going. Uh, especially since it was pouring rain yeah. to start the game. That's never fun to sit there in the rain. I don't care who you are. <laughs> No, it's not. I've done that a few times. All right. Well, that's all the numbers I had for that particular segment on By the Numbers. All right. Thank you for that, Uh, Roger. uh, Let's take a break here, and then when we get back, you'll hear from former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel with a lot of good uh, discussion this week. Hey, this is Travis Dever, Kai's Real Estate, the Dever team, New Smyrna Beach. Your source for real estate and everything else, New Smyrna Beach. Proud sponsor of Nightline. Call me anytime at 386-690-1636. That's 386-690-1636. Let me show you my hometown, New Smyrna Beach, UCF's favorite beach. Go Knights and charge on. Raising the bar on what to expect from your personal injury attorney is our commitment to you at Chad Bar Law. I'm Chad Bar, and as a UCF alum, I am proud to present Nightline at Night, Central Florida's only call-in show dedicated to our UCF nights, every Tuesday at 9 p.m. And remember, if you or a loved one are injured in an auto accident, call us at 407-599-9036 to schedule your free consultation or visit us at chadbarlaw.com. Offices, Altamont Springs. Go Knights. Charge on. Welcome to Inside the Huddle with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel, brought to you by the Little Greek Fresh Grill. Fresh, flavorful, fabulous water for lakes, 855 North Alfea Trail, Orlando. All right, welcome back, Kyle Israel. Uh, Kyle, man, uh, I... I've been in a horrible mood all day today. What happened? I mean, was that not one of the weirdest games you've ever seen in your life? I thought it was uh, very strange, um, without a doubt. Obviously, I think, uh, you know, the the nature of the game as far as the rain, uh, the lack of fan base uh, being allowed in the stadium. And then, you know, it really reminded me of, of Tulsa last year, like flashbacks, real flashbacks, I think. Last year, we may have only scored three points in the second half. We scored three points in the second half this year. And uh, the momentum swing that you saw right before halftime um, was really evident. And I think that carried, obviously, into the second half. But overall, it was a very strange game, very strange atmosphere, really even hard for me to get into it from home. And, um, and I don't like that feeling. There's no doubt about that. Hey, Kyle. Uh, so thinking about that, I mean, DG was off a little bit. Uh, how much of that was the rain and how much of that do you think he was just out of sync or out of sorts? Well, it's interesting. You know, I wasn't at the game last night, so I don't really have uh, enough context to, to say based on the conditions, you know, this was, this is what happened because I just didn't, I wasn't out there, but when you can see rain on television, you know, it's coming down pretty good, at least at times during that game. And, um, listen, we asked him to throw the ball 51 times. And I think that, uh, that's a hard thing to do playing in the rain, which I've done before. Um, you know, both teams have to do it. Zach Smith threw very well, right? In the second half, it was on target and, and threw some beautiful balls really throughout the end of the second quarter through the end of the game. So it didn't affect him too much. Um, but I think when you just ask Dylan to do it and the nature that, that, that we're forced to do it, which is, you know, there's not a lot of time between plays, right? So a lot of times in a game where the ball is wet or there's rain, if your ball boys are on point on the sideline, they're trying to get a new ball into the referee's hand, you know, one, two, uh, every three plays uh, right there on the sideline. Well, with our tempo, we're, we're right up to the line of scrimmage and the ball that was just used on the last play. Um, a lot of the times, not every time, but a lot of the times is the ball that's continuing to be used. And, and generally, if it's touched a player or fallen on the ground or, or just whatever, it's going to be more wet. And I don't know if that had to do uh, you know, with, with some of his, I guess you could saw, you know, he was very accurate at times last night. Um, and at the same time, I think, you know, Tulsa played really good defense, but I think the ball could, you know, the, the, the elements played a factor, but 
not enough to, to be the outcome of the game. As far as all the penalties go, have we been figured out? I mean, is this a thing where we weren't set from the beginning most of the time anyway, and then now the referees have just finally picked up on this? I have to go back and watch a lot of film to really get that, you know, that to really get my true opinion on that. But, you know, I don't, I don't know that it is, right? Like, referees are pretty good. I think that there's probably coaches that, that are writing things in d- during the course of the week saying, hey, you know, look at this. Look at, you know, look at how quickly they're setting this ball. You know, look, guys aren't set for a second, um, you know, where the referees may be a little bit more aware of what's going on. I don't know that referees are out there all of a sudden, you know, calling games differently. Um, I think, it, you know, when you watch the game and, and I'm, I'm having this conversation with you guys after only watching it one time in person. Um, but when you watch the game, you could see a lot of the false starts and uh, maybe guys were leaning before trying to get a little bit of a head start. But when you look at the context of this football game, Tulsa had three gigantic defensive linemen that were able to get great penetration throughout the night. They've been notorious for making tackles in the backfield. And when you know you're facing a stout defensive front like that, offensive linemen are trying to get an advantage and um, trying to get a, a little bit of a quicker step. And I think that came to her that, that came into bite us in the rear end a few times during that game um, because that D line was putting so much pressure on us. It wasn't just uh, the D line, man. They had uh, a six foot four, two hundred and sixty pound linebacker, yeah, uh, as well. So yeah. uh, the, they they were some big boys. Now. Um, the one thing that, that they were doing, they were playing a 3 4 4, which is similar to what Pitt played and also Cincy played last year. But they, and to your point, they still got pressure. They had 10 tackles for a loss this game. How much, what, what gives Dylan and the offensive linemen such a hard time when they're facing something like that? Well, I even think that you're seeing probably more of a 3 3 5. Um, so they, they had a lot of times last night. Uh, you know, an extra defensive back in there. And, and you know, what that does off- offensively, you'd like to think that there's no excuse for 10 tackles for loss f- facing a three-man front. Now, obviously, Tulsa, you know, on rundowns is generally trying to add a fourth rusher no matter what. So one of those linebackers will come in and fill a gap, and, and they were doing that some last night. Um, but I don't know if there was uh, a tip-off with the way that we do things that Tulsa saw on film or saw on the backfield. But they looked like they were really a- angling to the to the side to where we were running to wanting to run the football uh, when we were trying to break it outside some of the time, and so that you know if if you're getting penetration with three down linemen, um, that's demoralizing. And if you're a defensive coordinator, that's the best that you could hope for. So I think that our you know offensive line and I and I try not to be critical like I've you know over the years uh stated you guys I try not to be critical of the players individual players I know what it feels like on the other side of that I know what it feels like to have death threats and and other things tire slash like it's not fun when you don't play well but as a unit our offensive line got got beat up last night and uh there were some bright spots but that was very evident especially in in crucial downs Uh, in inside the red zone we were trying to run the ball in Secondly, for Dylan, a three-three-five defense, or or even a three-four-four, um, you know, it adds extra guys into zones. And one thing Tulsa was able to do, uh, and I said this a week or two ago, uh, is you know we're going to face a stout defensive backfield that can get up in our face and put pressure on us at the line of scrimmage. And the question is, what do we do when that happens? And how does our offense? Uh, you know, stay on, on schedule when that happens. And I think when you have five defensive backs, they're able to fill these little zones in the field that are normally open. I think back to the interception, you know, when you have a defensive backfield with that many guys, Jacob Harris, uh, you know, is coming up on coming across on like a deeper slant on third down or second down. And we're trying to, you know, squeeze one in there. Dylan throws an accurate ball, but there's another guy right there to hit Jacob. And that's what jars the ball loose. That's what puts it up into the air so that their linebacker number 23 can make an interception. And uh, when you're, when you're not able to lean on and establish the running game against the three, three, five defense, uh, it's very, very hard for the quarterback to, to do the work he wants to do because there's just a lot of defensive backs back there roaming the field. Why wouldn't every other team do exactly the same thing Tulsa did last night to beat us from now on? Well, I think it comes down to personnel, Andrew. I mean, a lot of programs recruit for specific types of defenses. So your team may be built to be a 4-3 defense. 
Um, if you have the type of athletes that you think can play in space and be on the same page, um, you know, then, then maybe you try to do a three down, uh, type of scheme against us. But if you don't have guys that are out there practicing that all the time, guys can get out of position. Um, you know, sometimes in that style of defense, you can see really big time blown coverages, uh, because it's not something that they do all the time. It's not in, in, you know, their standard, uh, method of procedure, I guess. So I think a lot of it comes down to personnel. And if the team has the personnel to go out there and run a scheme like that, um, you know, they may try that, but again, that defense doesn't work unless you have three stout defensive linemen and Tulsa had that. I'm not sure uh, everybody else on our schedule or even a few teams on our schedule are going to have that type of talent across the front. All right. Hey, I'm going to change this up just a little bit. I've compiled a bunch of quotes from Twitter, the message boards, all kinds of things. I just want to get your opinion on each one of these. And it's going to be a little bit weird. Um, You can either disagree with them or not disagree with them or go someplace in the middle with them. Because some of them I agree with, some of them I don't agree with, some of them are absolutely ludicrous. But I think this could be fun. Because we're all bummed out about this game, and I just think that that this will, will be fun. All right, so the first one. And some of these are a little crazy. I'm telling you right now. This one, in particular, Fire Coach Heupel. I mean, well, <laughs> go ahead. Here's my, here's my response to that. Coach Heupel is 24 and 5 as our head coach. So, um, and, 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 you know, we've only, I would say the, the thing that sticks out to me in that regard is that, you know, in games that are less than eight points, like we're three and five in. And so we've lost close games. Now, if you want to take a snapshot of that, and say he can't win close ball games, well, then you at least may have an argument. However, when a coach is 24 and five, um, and our program is where we are, uh, and I mean, thinking of everything COVID, no money in the budget, uh, down year from boosters, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth, you know, this is not the time to fire Coach Heipel. And it, with his record, um, and with what he's done thus far, I don't think that you can fire a coach, uh, but you can definitely. Uh, make some noise about frustration. All right, uh, Roger, if you would go down the list as well, just pick a random one. Um, next one on here, the players quit. Um, yeah, I felt the same way. I felt the same way. Uh, I certainly saw that very clearly on the last drive that Tulsa had where we had about four or five minutes left in the game and we were going to have a chance to get the ball back and try to march down the field to get the eight points that we needed. And our defense couldn't get off the field. They converted a third down. They were able to run it down our throat. They ran it up the middle. They ran it off the tackle. uh, And they were gashing us. I really felt like it was evident then. But when you look at, you know, the end of the first half where I don't know the exact amount of time, but maybe 30 to 50 seconds left after Tulsa had scored, we really didn't try to push the ball down the field. We didn't try to go down the field and score. And I thought Coach Heupel and the staff could have set the tone right there saying, you know, I understand the elements, okay, and and that you've turned the ball over a few times, and the last thing you want to do is create more momentum for Tulsa uh, by giving up a turnover. However, um, with the type of offense that we have, you at least like to see us push the ball down the field, knowing that we're about to come back out on offense, and we have an opportunity right there, whether we score or not, to build some momentum. Um, and, And I think that that may have been uh, felt throughout the team and then you have the deflating turnover on the second half kickoff and which was a great play uh, by that Tulsa player phenomenal play and I feel like the air just got taken out of us and for the first time that I can remember I saw a team that was up 25 to 12 two scores feel like they gave up while they were ahead and I don't know uh, if that's a reality, but it certainly felt that way. And, and I could see how, you know, somebody in our fan base would, would see that. All right. Here's the next one. Heupel has lost this team. Well, who's the leader of this team is my question. Um, it, I know people like to say McKenzie's a huge part of the culture and, you know, him being in the facility, uh, you know, provides an element of leadership and even maybe on the sideline, but he can't be the leader if he's not on the field. He can't be a lead, the core leader. And he's certainly not going to be the guy. Uh, from the sideline that can turn around the energy of a football team. At least it didn't happen last night. And so 
Um, you know, I want to know who's a leader on this football team because there was nobody that felt like they stepped up. We didn't see a huddle on the sideline. Um, you know, we didn't really see players taking control and, um, you add on the just ludicrous amount of penalties, disgustingly amount. I don't even know if that's a word, but just <laughs> atrocious amount of penalties. Today. <laughs> um, yeah, I can tell you right now, if when I was playing for Coach O'Leary, if I was a player, I would be super afraid, number one, of going to the team meeting that would have happened at 7 o'clock on Sunday night, and number two, be even more afraid for what was going to happen at practice on Monday. And that's two weeks in a row. It's glaring. Uh, when they're back to back weeks like that, you got to ask yourself the question, like, are we doing the things that we need to do from a coaching staff perspective to gain control of this team, to make sure that they understand how critical these penalties are? And secondly, do we have anybody that's going to step up on this football team from a player perspective and be a leader? And when a game's starting to change momentum, step up and say, we're not going to let this happen. And so right now, um, you know, I don't, I feel as though, I don't know if he's lost the team, uh, but there seems as though there's not a, an element of respect and, and you don't really see it on the sideline from coach Heupel either in regards to addressing players throughout the game. Um, and so that could only lead you to believe that, you know, that's not the way or a style of his coaching. All right. Next one on the list. Speaking of the fact that you didn't see anything on Heupel, he waved the white flag at halftime. I think that, you know, that was the thing at the end of the half. Like, yeah, we, we, you know, I felt like we should have at least tried to go down the field and score. Tulsa had some great momentum where they literally, I think it was second and 10 and Zach Smith hit like just three passes in a row, marched him down the field. And we needed to at least go out and, and get an answer to change the tone of how we were going to go into the halftime. But instead of, going into halftime with a little bit of momentum. Uh, we gave up a touchdown after we weren't able to score in the red zone and missed a field goal, but didn't play well, in my opinion, in the first half for the, you know, for the most part, uh, outside of taking some advantage of the defense. I, I felt like we waved the right flag. Yes. Coach okay. did. All right. The next one I'm going to pick here is the center should have been pulled from the game. Well, I don't know the depth chart, so I know that he's a young player. And uh, there were certainly, certainly challenges on the last drive, right? Got false start and a holding when Dylan was able to scramble down inside the 15-yard line. Um, I want to really remind just... people that the, the center – I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to yeah. remind people that the center is an extremely, extremely important position on the football field. I mean – Extremely. It's not one of those positions you really rotate – somebody in and out and and once you're in the game i mean unless you feel like you really have somebody that can play as well or better uh it's, you just don't ever see that happening that guy's you know matt's in there starting for a reason um but it wasn't his best ball game there's no doubt about that and players have bad days he they obviously had do. a bad day the lord knows i've had a handful that people <laughs> that listen to this podcast definitely know about <laughs> 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 All right, Roger, go well, ahead. Kyle, at some point, I'm pretty sure there were people calling to have you replaced too, right? <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> no doubt about it. It's part of the deal. Uh, the QB should have been pulled at least for a series or two. That's an interesting one. You hear this all the time, though. This is one that, that I could put on almost every show that we do. Uh, I don't see how you pull Dylan. Um, I mean, unless you thought you were going to get him to the sideline and, and, and show him some things that he may not be seeing um, with what he's done in the first two games. I mean, you know, we touted like the same guy that's saying that also tweeted earlier in the week touting Dylan as a Heisman candidate, right? So, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that's pretty asinine. And, you know, it wasn't as though Dylan was – the reason we lost that football game, uh, Tulsa played very good defensive coverage and there were times that our wide receivers weren't able to get off, but Dylan hit some huge passes, passes to Jalen Robinson down the sideline. Um, you know, he, he made plays throughout the game. Um, but there were times that he was inaccurate and there were times that people just weren't open. And I don't think you pull him out for any of those reasons. Yeah. That was not targeting. Speaking of Josiah's cradle. Oh, man, that one makes me sick to my stomach. I feel bad for him. Um, I think that was such a huge momentum swing in the football game, uh, that play. And 
listen, I think the, the safety for Tulsa was, you know, off balance. It looked like it, it looked like he didn't have his feet and a player. I understand protecting the players and trying to keep the crown of the helmet up. And it's important to do that. Don't get me wrong. It is important to, to do that, but that's such a bang, bang play in the middle of a game down the field where, you know, the defender is taking a hit because they're, they're, you know, they're basically trying to absorb the play and just get the guy to the ground. And we're trying to finish through the play and gain a few extra yards. And, you know, the helmet comes down. It's just those referees. It's so hard, even, you know, when it's obvious from a defensive perspective to control your body, uh, you know, sometimes in space like that. And when you're the, the, when you're the offensive player, it's not as though you can come out with your hands to protect yourself. It's your shoulder and essentially your head. Uh, I hate the call. I hate the call. I, I felt like it was, it was uh, a tough part of, game, of the game for us to get a call against us like that. Yeah, and one of the things that you're doing right now has to deal with a lot of things that uh, one of the reasons why the targeting uh, rule was put into football, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, with Nestri, uh, Nestri is an acronym for NeuroStrength, um, is a company that I'm a part of or a startup. And a lot of the work and research that we're doing is in the space of uh, CTE and cognitive decline and the effects that it has on athletes, both, uh, you know, right out of college and, you know, throughout one's life. And so when I said that I do know, you know, how important it is to be able to play the game the right way and avoid injury, um, that's critical. And don't don't get my statement about saying I don't like the call wrong with with, you know, confused with that. Um, but I just think that when you see an offensive player uh, who has no other way to defend themselves as they're running full speed and moving forward, that uh, it's just a tough call to make in that point of the game. But the player safety is is critical, and it's a real thing uh, that, that people are struggling with uh, when their days are over. Yeah, and I was arguing, kind of arguing with someone on the board last night. I was just trying to make my point that this – call honestly if you read the rule because i went back and i read the rule and they showed it Mm -hmm. on tv as well he did lower his head he did yes uh and lead with the crown of his helmet that's explicitly in the freaking rule so that is why they called this call uh he did not jump he didn't uh you know uh i don't know what it is what it says in there like uh it's like lunge or something, but he, he didn't do that, but he lowered his head and you could very easily get your neck or your head hurt in that situation. It's to protect the players. It's not because they want football to become flag football or anything else like that. Uh, this is all about player protection. And, and I, as much as I, I hate the call, I, I kind of agree. I hate the call, but <laughs> if you read the rule, it's in there. You know what I'm saying? Um, I do. So he, launch is the word I was trying to think of. Launch off your feet, it says in there. He didn't do any of that. But I could see, and when, when he did it, I, 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 I thought to myself, oh, man, I hope he doesn't get hurt. I hope he doesn't hurt himself doing that. You know right. what I'm saying? So. I do. All right. The next one we've got is fire the O-line coach. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh, man. I, again, um, that sounds like a yes. <laughs> fi- no, fi- fire is fire is brutal. You're right? not firing like, anybody at this point. I, I don't think that we're at any point to be firing anybody. Um, I feel as though we've become this elitist school and myself and my mindset at times tends to go that way. And I have to put things in perspective. Um, the offensive line has played great uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, they struggled last night with a good defensive front. Uh, we did have, uh, plays with Otis out of the backfield, we were able to run the ball well, um, you know, and so uh, I think it was just a good hard nosed football game where where they got the best of us up front. Um, if you want to go to the penalty side of it, um, yeah, I mean, I I would be that's where I would say there's some frustration is as an offensive line coach, as an offensive coordinator, as the head coach, you got to be accountable for those guys being able to do the bare minimum, which is uh, you know not jump off sides or have a false start. So that's where my uh, criticism criticism would go is, is from a penalty perspective, but you're not firing anybody uh, at this point, and I don't think that they deserve it. Yeah. There are two more left. One, this one we kind of already covered a little bit, but I want to get it in there. Hypel can't get his guys focused. Well, 
focus. Interesting topic because one thing that did stick out to me is that obviously with the lens of the world that we all have through social media these days, uh, you typically you get to see some of what the players are doing the night before the game. And so I felt a little bit uneasy when I saw on one of the players' Instagram pages that there was a group of players, you know, hanging out and dancing in the hotel room the night before the game. My context being I played for George O'Leary where the last thing you were going to do is laugh uh, on a bus ride or uh, be up in other players' rooms having a good time, uh, you know, the the night before a game. And I think that there's an element that can be important as far as playing loose and, and being comfortable um, and not being uptight. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of struck me the wrong way when I did see that wondering if our football team was continuously focused. Now, um, you know, these are very challenging times for these players uh, to play football as far as, you know, just the day to day uh, barriers for them to get through before they actually get on the field. And, you know, I want them to enjoy their time together. That's what college football is all about. But um, we if you if the game panned out how the beginning of it started, where our defense seemed very focused, was able to create some turnovers, um, you know, and we jump out to a quick lead. Uh, I would say, like, how do we keep them focused throughout the course of the game, keep them motivated, keep them dialed in? Um, because it almost feels like at times we're, we're, we're front runners um, based on, you know, us getting up in games and not really being tested sometimes. I, I feel as though, you know, we play well from, uh, you know, ahead, but can we stay focused enough throughout the course of a game when a ball game is, is close? All right, Roger, there's one more left on the list. This is the worst UCF performance I have ever watched. (laughs) Uh, This must be a fan that that hasn't seen many football games of ours. Uh, We've had way, (laughs) way, way worse games uh, than this. Certainly uh, games that that I've seen firsthand that I've played in. Um, Maybe if you wanted to say in this new era of football, when the expectation uh, for, for UCF has been so high, we're ranked 11th in the country. Um, I think the scenario and what was on the line, which this year with the way the Big 12 uh, is playing, um, there may there may have been a scenario where a group of five team could get into the playoff. And so uh, with those things on the line, it may feel as though this is the worst game uh, in UCF that you've ever seen, but it certainly uh, most emphatically is not. I'm going to uh, dig into the Ask Nightline mailbag here real quick and ask you one more. This is from Brian W. Peterson. How much does last night's loss hurt our brand and recent success in the eyes of doubters? Can we recover our momentum in the national spotlight where where we were just starting to earn the respect of haters? Um, It doesn't help to do that on ESPN2. I can certainly say that. I mean, one of the things that was always important to us as we were growing was get on national television as much as possible. And now that we're there every week, you know, games like this are going to hurt a little bit. Um, I think that, you know, when you see a Michigan or Texas or one of these or Oklahoma, you know, these schools lose like their brand is kind of tarnished for a year. Is it overall? No. But do they do they get the, the national publicity that they would throughout the course of a season being undefeated hell no so i think it definitely hurts this year with the exposure uh that we're going to get if 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 there's ucf haters out there which there are and i see um you know this gives them something to uh you know really throw in our face without a doubt um and you know most of the country isn't going to know that tulsa is actually a pretty good defense with a stout defensive backfield and good defensive linemen and they have played really good the last half of the the last half of uh, last season uh you know people aren't gonna know that they're gonna see Tulsa and be like man you guys lost to them and uh you know two years in a row and so I think that it hurts this year I think that what was on the line that maybe uh you know going away to some extent will hurt the exposure that we're potentially going to have um but as far as the season's concerned we still have a lot of football left we can win out play for a conference championship play on television a number of times uh, moving forward. If we get in the conference championship game, we'll be on ABC again, uh, more than likely. So uh, it, it definitely hurt. 
Um, but but I don't think that it changes the overall perspective. Yeah, I will say that Tulsa actually also really took it to Oklahoma State as well. Yep. It was ranked highly at that point as well, and now they've just beat number 11. So technically they should probably be in the poll. Uh, I mean, it, they should have won that football game, and, and that would have looked better for us, I yeah. guess, at this point, yeah. uh, one way or another. Hopefully they have a, a, a good season going forward. I, I'm unfortunately kind of rooting for them to have a good season. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, just that won't make us look nearly as bad. Roger, you got anything else for Kyle? Uh, no, just that uh, that I tend to agree with his assessment. I mean, it was, and to your point, Kyle, this was the number four defense in the country before mm-hmm. uh, they came into UCF. And, and people won't be aware of that, unfortunately, because most of the folks that are voting or most of the folks that are commentating are uh, not paying attention. They're seeing scores, they're seeing uh, records, and that's it. I, I will say this, now that they've got their quarterback clicking a little bit as he was in the second half or right around halftime, I think they may have a better shot in the AAC and to make some noise there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yep. you know, the Oklahoma State definitely, that Oklahoma State game definitely would have helped us had they won it, and and their big challenge was their quarterback wasn't clicking, but he's a TCU transfer, and um, Baylor you know transfer. it's it's a it was a much better team than I think anybody else was expecting or that they will see. Mm-hmm. All righty, Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it, and thanks for playing along with our little uh, new game we have there with the, the uh, statements. I I kind of enjoyed that personally. Well, enjoy the week off uh, this upcoming weekend. It would have been nice to, to, to obviously go into a bye week with a victor. I can certainly say it's much easier uh, to get through the bye week as a player coming off a victory, but it's very timely. You know, we didn't mention, I didn't mention, we had a lot of guys that were banged up yesterday. There were times in the game where uh, I had to look at a roster to see who was on the field. Um, so I hope that our guys, most importantly, can get healthy, stay safe through COVID. It's just amazing that they're out there playing football uh, in the first place right now. And, um, you know, although it's frustrating, uh, my, my loyalty doesn't waver, and I'll be looking forward to a big game against Memphis. Absolutely. We will talk to you soon. All right, guys. Talk to you later. I'm Jeff Allen. Elsewhere around the American, SMU coughed up a 21-point first half lead to Memphis. And after the defenses took hold of the second half, the Mustangs forced a Brady White fumble with 125 left, which set up Chris Nagar's 43-yard game-winning field goal as SMU topped the 25th-ranked Tigers 30-27 to and moved to 4-0. Number 15, Cincinnati is 3-0 as they recorded five interceptions and downing South Florida 28-7. Navy was held under 100 yards rushing as they dropped a commander in chief trophy series game to Air Force by a 40 to 7 score and East Carolina after an opening pick six score was dismantled by Georgia State 49 29. We'll recap those contests and get you set for this week's games as Temple and Houston hope to take the field for the first time in respective games this season on the AAC report only on the Nightline Sports Network. All right, now it's time for Roger's Five Alarm Hot Take of the Week. Roger, what you got for us? All right, so this week my hot take is the O-line will lose us two, not just one, but two games this year. So when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about penalties, snaps, penetration, all of those things. So two games on the O-line this year. What do you think, Andrew? I don't like it. I don't like that we're going to lose two games. Uh, I... I could see it happening, though, if, if they play uh, the way that uh, they did this last game. I could see it, but I don't want to even think that. So, Well, I mean, if you think about Cincinnati, right, we're going to be playing Cincinnati again later in the year. Played that three five five on us last time, big and beefy up front. Um, their, their secondary also played well, so they look an awful lot like what this Tulsa team did. So if this O-line does not step it up, uh, and does not meet the challenge. Um, you know, they've you've had Pitt last year, you've had Cincy last year, now you've got Tulsa this year and last year. Same setup for teams, same uh, makeup, similar defenses that they played. That spells trouble for us this year, and we're going to play at least one more of those type of defenses in Cincinnati. Yeah. So, and if we play them in the championship game, we'll play them twice. So that's two games this year 
that I, I feel like we could be in danger because we're playing that type of defense, that size, and their one-on-one matchups with us and how physical they play uh, hinders us in what we want to do in creating isolation with one-on-one matchups. So yeah, that's well, where hope, that's – Yeah, Go hopefully ahead. by that time we will figure something out uh, to do in this situation once it happens again, though. That's what I'm hoping. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, the the only other thing, too, I wanted to mention, and, and you know, I've been mentioning this for two weeks now, but Dylan, uh, when the pocket is collapsing, um, he's, in my opinion, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, too, but in my opinion, I think he's sitting in, uh, sitting in the pocket a little too long again. So he started running and sprinkling in running, but they were more designed runs or designed options. And you saw this game. He, st- he climbed the ladder, stepped out of the pocket, and took off and run. But there were at least two or three times where he should have done that more quickly uh, and and taken off instead of allowing or trying to watch a receiver get loose. And it ended up being either a sack, a tackle for a loss, or a thrown away ball. Uh, and I feel like that's an, a, an opportunity in the dimension of the game that we have to continue to develop to help the O-line out when those uh, receivers are covered and are not creating separation. I can see that a little bit. He's got a lot to do back there uh, as far as his checkdowns and all that stuff go as well, though. So I don't know if I would totally agree with that one, but uh, I'll watch it a little closer from now on for sure. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, stats. We had have a few more things that we can talk about with the stats here. Uh, total yards, 455 yards, down almost 200 yards uh, versus 438 uh, in less than a week. Is that right? Well, and, and, and with that, you know, the 455 versus we had over 600 yards the past two games, right? So that's almost 200 yards down. Remember, we've lost 300, so 124 of those are just from penalties uh, as well. But we were putting up 600 yards with the penalties. Right. And then the 438 is actually what, um, you know, was Tulsa uh, Tulsa's total. So in spite of losing the game, um, they had less yards than us. And we actually – our defense played better in holding – their yards than we did versus ECU. So ECU gained more yards than what they did this week. That being said, that goes back to the efficiency uh, rating numbers of what the offense is doing. We'll see that a little bit later. All right. You want to run through the rest of these real quick? Sure. Uh, Pass yards. uh, We had 330 versus 273. So they had 273 yards. We had 330. Obviously, that was down from last week, and when uh, where Dylan had well over 400 yards. Um, also, our rush yards we had 125 versus they are 165, so they had about 35 or so more rush yards. But what was really important about that number is we've been averaging over 200 yards on the ground with uh, roughly this uh, similar amount of possession. So. Not only are our yards down on passing, they're also down on rushing as well. Penalties, uh, we gave up 18 for 124. They had 8 for 95. So that's 28 yards were given up to them on average just from that. Uh, we had 21 first downs. That's down 8 from last year. So same number, or last week. So same number of possessions, but a lot less first downs. So that means we're going three and outs uh, or punting. Um, they had 23, which was actually better. So our defense collectively has played better, uh, than what they had the first two weeks. Our offense is not third downs, six of 15, which is 40%. And that's down 10% what they were last week, um, versus what Tulsa had. They were seven for 18, which is better, but they had more opportunities. Fourth downs, uh, we didn't try for any, they were for one for one. Now here's something that's interesting. Total plays. We had 82 plays that we ran this week. Okay. That's only two less than what we played last week. However, Tulsa had 73 plays that they ran. Obviously, they run a slower offense for the most part, although they have a little bit of tempo. 
tempo. But that goes to show you how much more efficient they were with those big plays than what we were. So they almost beat us at our own game, uh, for lack of a, a better term. Uh, yards per play, six yards down uh, 1.25 over last week. And they had uh, a 5.4 per play, which was better than ECU and Georgia Tech uh, for the defense. So our defense played better. Yards per completion, 6.5. That's down 2.2. So we were well over eight yards uh, per completion, almost nine yards per completion last week. Again, that goes to show you the explosive plays just weren't there. And I think a lot of that has to do uh, with the coverage that uh, that Tulsa was providing because they were playing extremely physical. Tulsa, uh, consequently, had 9.4 yards. So they were up two yards uh, versus ECU uh, last week. So that tells you that they're getting more exp- less plays but more explosive plays, and you saw that start uh, right before the half. Yards per carry, 3.7, which is also down two yards per carry on average over what we averaged last week. Um, they had 3.8, which is actually better uh, for the defense as well. Uh, our red zone attempts, we were only in the red zone four times this week. Last week, it was eight times. So that tells you how many plays, possessions, and how efficient we were. We were three for four this week. The one lone time we didn't score was when uh, we had a field goal that, that somehow went sideways. Uh, they were three for three. And that goes to show you that most of their scores came from those long bomb situations uh, that we were talking about before. Time of possession, actually pretty uh, similar. Uh, we had uh, the ball just uh, just around 28 and change. They had it in just around 31 and change. Um, turnovers, three versus three. Uh, that was a big difference over the past two weeks. Yes, we got three turnovers this week, but obviously they made up for them as well. We couldn't take advantage of that. Uh, we lost two fumbles this week. Uh, we had two sacks this week. Uh, and last week we didn't have any, so that was uh, that was a advantage. And then tackles for a loss. We had eight tackles for a loss, so we continue to rack those up. Um, and um, the the opposition though last week, ECU only had two tackles for a loss, while uh, Tulsa had ten. So that speaks to that offensive line again. And that line play and being and having Dylan under duress. Uh, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I had the time of possession wrong. It was 29 26 versus 30 34. So, again, even with time of possession, that speaks to how much more quickly we run than what Tulsa does. They had bigger plays, uh, and that was the difference in the game. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. So uh, we definitely did not uh, live up to the expectations this week at all. Welcome to this week's poll position. All right, well, that tells you that it is time to uh, look at the polls for this week. The coaches poll, we wind up at number 25. And then the AP poll, we fell out of the AP poll. We're actually 29th in that situation at this point. So, uh, Roger, what do you think of those? So, I think for the coaches poll, I think 25 uh, was reasonable considering that we didn't, how bad we looked in doing it, right? right? Both with the turnovers and the penalties and everything else. Do I think we should have gone 29? No, I don't think we should have popped out of the top 25. There were several schools that did this week, but, uh, you know, Oklahoma, for example, with two uh, losses out of, now. Yeah, but they had two losses, exactly. So I, I think, like, based on our quote unquote resume our first two games i think 25 is about right i think 29 is a little bit long but i will say i do think we're in a great position that if we play well especially with as hyped as memphis has been uh as a a, as a former aac champion and and you've heard it on in the news and in the uh, sports world uh, I think that will allow us to climb back in it in the AP, uh, which will be just in the nick of time because the college football playoff rankings will be here sooner than we know it. 
Yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, let's talk about you – know, last week we decided to create a new uh, <laughs> section where we talked about Andrew's AP poll. <sighs> Uh, what do you think your, uh, where would you rank us? Well, I would probably, I wouldn't have taken us all the way down to 25. I don't think we're are all the way down to 29 and out of the poll, the AP. Uh, I just feel like that we're not that bad. This was an ugly game. Yes. It was on television where everyone could see it. Luckily it was not on ABC and it was on ESPN too, but I don't think that we're, uh, number 29 there's also still a bunch of teams in there that haven't even played a game yet which upsets me so there's games there's there's teams in there that haven't played a game but we're worse than them that that just it doesn't make any sense i don't know why the ap is keeping teams that haven't even played yet from the big 10 in there so if if those teams were not in there that would bring us back in at least at 25. And I think that that's where it should be, personally. Okay, so it sounds like we're in agreement. Yeah. Uh, And maybe even a little bit higher. I just don't think that we're that bad. Yes, we've had our penalty issues. Yes, you know, that looks bad. I think that's going to get fixed at some point. I do. It needs to get fixed. We have a bye week coming up. This is the perfect time to fix it. Yeah. I agree with you. I mean, it, it certainly should be a focus. Not only are you installing, you know, you can wait to install the rest of your stuff. You need to get your fundamentals right. So um, there were there were a few other things that I would like for them to work on, too. Our defensive backs got burned um, a little bit as well. Uh, and, and their speed was not anything to write home about in the wide receiver course. So those are the two areas that I'd really like for them to focus on is, is those penalties and the fundamentals and the defensive backs. And who knows even if Richie Grant will be back. So that'll be another thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, hopefully he's not on concussion proto- protocol after uh, being knocked out like that. He, I would assume that he probably would be because that usually goes hand in hand. But we shall see. Also, you know, uh, at the end of the game, and I wasn't there, so I didn't totally see the whole thing, but it looked like that uh, Marlon Williams got hurt right at the end on the very last play in the end zone as well. Uh, And I thought I read somewhere that somebody thought they saw him, like, being carried out on a spine board. So hopefully... uh, Hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully he is okay. I have not heard anything as far as that goes, but I, I did hear somebody say something like that. So hopefully yeah, that they were wrong. Blow. I know that uh, he was landed on by one of our other receivers, and I can't remember who it was. Uh, just trying to remember it, but yeah, so that would be really ugly. Yeah, and one more thing I wanted to bring up that was actually good news since uh, we've been all doom and gloom. We did sign a four-star uh, point guard to uh, our basketball team. So I'm excited that we're going to be able to talk with Ben about that on Nightline at Night. So make sure you sign, that you tune in on Tuesday. Remember last week we missed a, a show because of the debates. Make sure you uh, tune in on Tuesday and we'll, uh, we'll give you some more details about him. Actually, yeah, uh, good thing you brought uh, Tuesday up. Exactly. Uh, We weren't on last week, like Roger said, but we will be this week, and we would love to have you guys call in and talk about the way you feel about this game. It's the perfect uh, vehicle to do that. We're there for you to call in. We have lots of phone lines, uh, and we would love for people to call in. And tell us, uh, and get it out. Get it out and talk to us about, uh, you know, what you would like to see happen, what you didn't like that you saw happen, uh, and you can even make your case for why you want to fire Josh Heupel, because we will definitely talk about uh, people saying that. So Tuesday night, WDBO, 107.3 and 580 AM. And uh, also on the WDBO app, you can use that anywhere and listen to it. You can also listen on Alexa. Just say, hey, Alexa, play 107.3 WDBO uh, and all that stuff. And you can also call in and leave open mics on that app as well, which is really cool where you don't have to talk to us, but you can leave kind of a voicemail for us. So please tune in and, and, and call in this week. We'd love to hear from you guys. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fagley reminding you to tune in every Tuesday night, 9 to 10 p.m. on WDBO 107.3 FM 
and AM 580, plus the WDBO app for Nightline at Night. Brought to you by Chad Bar Law. We'll be taking your calls and your texts, reacting to the previous week's UCF sports action, and you never know who will show up. Once again, that's Nightline at Night, every Tuesday, 9 to 10 p.m. on WDBO 1073 FM and AM 580, plus the WDBO app. Go Knights and charge on. Spice up your company with homemade marketing services from Tasty Gravy Creative. Tasty Gravy serves up a menu of budget-friendly marketing, graphic design, and public relations services customized to your specific goals. Co-owned by a UCF graduate, Tasty Gravy can help refresh your brand, strengthen your online presence, or reinforce your company's message. Contact Tasty Gravy for help with your website, social media, marketing, advertising materials, and more. Visit TastyGravy.com. Hey Jeep Wrangler owners, have you ever sat in your office at work and watched the rain just pour into your Jeep because the weatherman said that there was a zero chance of rain? Or you put your doors back on because there was a 100% chance and then not a drop of rain fell? Well, there's a company out there that can help take the worry away and give you the peace of mind to be without your doors. The company's called Life Without Doors. They make waterproof rain curtains and dash covers for Wranglers. Life Without Doors is there to help make the decision to leave the doors at home an easy one. Find out more at lifewithoutdoors.com. Ask a Nightline is brought to you by Chad Bar Law. Chad is a UCF alumnus and diehard Knights fan. Chad Bar Law handles auto accident, slip and fall, and personal injury cases. Call Chad today at 407-599-9036 for a free consultation. That's 407-599-9036. Armor up and call Chad Bar Law today. All right, time again for Ask Nightline. We're answering questions listeners posted on our Facebook page or via Twitter at hashtag Ask Nightline. Starting off with Golden Knight 2 again this week. Uh, given how much of a disaster this game was, how are you able to decipher between blaming a player and blaming a coach for missed opportunities and poor performance? Example, do I blame the center for all the penalties or Ellerby? Uh, coach Ellerby, the offensive line coach, for either not pulling him or fixing the issue. Roger, I'm going to let you take this one. Wow. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think there is a difference. I think, you know, it's a team based game. The coaching staff has parts of that uh, decision making when folks when things aren't going our way. Uh, and sometimes it means pulling someone to the sideline, giving them a breather and, and giving them some coaching on the sideline. Now, your center position, uh, I don't think you do that, especially, uh, you know, Kyle mentioned we don't know what that depth is. That being said, um, you know, part of it is adjustments. Uh, part of it's putting your players in, in position to win. Part of it is them having a bad day. I mean, Dylan uh, didn't have the day that we're used to um, seeing from him. And it all just kind of uh, happened all at once because we didn't get a break on their defensive end. They had a solid defensive team and they put things together in the second half. So, I mean, if you look at it this way, on average, we we averaged 26 points in the first half. We were right on target with that. The problem was the second half. So is that them adjusting to us? Or is that our players just not uh, playing up to their potential? Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I think that uh, it's a team sport. It's a team uh, loss and you blame the team. I don't think you ever, especially with a game like that last night, you can't blame one person for that. There were definitely a lot of penalties. Uh, but they, they'll fix this, I think, personally. All right, so uh, next, at UCF, MSU Clemson. This, he's asked a couple ones lately, and that's good. Thank you very much. New kind of a new name. Why did Dylan take the blame for the game that wasn't his fault? I'm going to start off by saying with this one. I said it when we talked about that quote in the first place. That uh, he's just that kind of a guy. He won't take the credit when credit is due, and then he'll he won't take the or he will take the blame when he doesn't have to. He's just that kind of a guy. He's a good guy. 
I, I think that he obviously is being the quarterback and, and one of the leaders seems like or, or feels like that he uh, that's it's just that he's a leader out there. And so it, it's his fault, I guess. Roger, you got something to say on that? No, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's twofold. One, it's who he is. And two, I think it's, uh, you know, him assuming the mantle of that leadership. One of the things you heard him talk about uh, coming into this year was that he wanted to establish himself more as a leader. And he talked to his dad about that. Uh, and part of that is making sure that you're the face of the franchise and that you're protecting your guys and that when you lose, you all lose. Uh, it's the same thing in business or any other uh, form of leadership. So I think he's just doing what he should be doing. And, and I also think it's personally his character, like you said. Yeah, awesome. I, I like that about him. I, I think that that's uh, a, a very uh, a good trait to have. And, and I think that that is him showing leadership. All right. So next one from at Ultima Steve. Uh, why does Heupel... Why does Heupel playing not to lose always cost him? Game management before first half, not returning kicks after a fumble. Uh, he just can't seem to create counter momentum. I don't think wow. that that's always the case. Uh, I don't don't think that, that he plays safe sometimes. And I don't think it, it, it always costs him the game. Um, you see him well, clearly. It doesn't always cost yeah, him the game. You see him play because <laughs> we've only got five losses. Exactly. You see him play. See him play safe in in almost every game at one point or another. Uh, game management before the first half. I don't have a problem really with the way that he did that. Uh, I just think it was him playing safe, and and I don't. I mean, I guess some people think that that took the momentum out and. I don't necessarily agree with that. That's just my personal opinion. Um, there's not a lot that you could do with that, uh, you know, amount of time. And then you don't definitely don't want to throw an interception or something, trying to get something into the end zone uh, from the spot that they were on the field and have it run back for a touchdown or something crazy happen. So uh, that's what I think about that. What about you, Roger? Well, there's a few things, uh, and I, I want to make a clear distinction. There's a difference between when we're up 40 or 50 points to like 18 or 20 points or whatever, and we're taking our foot off the gas because I feel like he learned a big lesson last year when uh, on the first game of the season we had one of our starting quarterbacks go out. Uh, ever since then, he's been a lot more conservative, and there's a difference between that and playing conservative in general. So – I don't think going into the half that that was playing conservative. I think that was them playing a much better defensive team than we've played all year long. I think they're better than Georgia Tech. Uh, they're certainly better than ECU. And uh, I think that that's what you were seeing. It wasn't him going conservative. The guys just weren't executing. So you had a combination of poor execution uh, of the game plan and I think he was just uh, specifically going to the half. I think he was just saying, all right, let's collect our thoughts. It happened. Let's figure it out uh, and, and go from there. As far as uh, game management is concerned, he's made some some boo-boos. But then again, he's also a, a, a first-time head coach. And this is his third season. So he's going to make uh, some of those questionable decisions and calls and thoughts and, and what have you. So do I think it's him constantly playing safe? No, I think there's a big difference between us, uh, you know, pulling back after we're up 30 points and putting the second and third teamers in there um, and then running the ball to try to run out the clock so that we can get out of there without getting anybody hurt. That, that's my opinion on that. Exactly. All right. Uh, next one from at bcope12. Uh, this is a big year for Hypel. There's actually two. There's a statement here and a couple questions. So uh, this is a big year for Hypel, and he won't be going anywhere anytime soon with this performance. So that was the statement. Uh, I agree. And that could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. We will soon find out, I think. Uh, and why is Heupel's offense so predictable? This is a problem. Can his this team bounce back against Memphis? Uh, I, I think that his 
offense is a little bit predictable. We've we've talked about this over and over, but it also works most of the time. I mean, more much more than not, 24 and 5. It works much more than it doesn't. So, uh predictable, I don't know about that. I mean, yes, it kind of is, but it works. I mean, what more can you ask for when it works? I don't think we ask these questions when it works. That's just my personal opinion. When it doesn't work, we, we want to dissect it and, and ask these questions. Uh, it is a problem when it doesn't work. It's definitely not a problem when it works. Uh, and can the team bounce back against Memphis? Absolutely they can bounce back against Memphis. We've seen this happen before. We've lost games before. Uh, so we see if it can be fixed or it can't be fixed. And I have uh, I have faith in the team and Coach Heupel and the rest of the coaches to get this fixed. I don't think that any of them took this lightly. I think that, that, that you know, nobody that plays any sport, I don't care if you're playing uh, cornhole or you're playing uh, football or or any other sport, well, we were watching the cornhole championships. Uh, that's why uh, during COVID off off season here. Yeah, that's why I mentioned it. I was trying to be funny. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes to lose. Period. I know the, these guys are heartbroken. Nobody wanted to lose this game. Uh, so I think that they do come back, and I think that uh, you know I'm not gonna not gonna say we win all the rest of them, but that would sure be nice. So Roger. So on predictability of the offense, I think he's got a core set of things that he does, and then he layers wrinkles on top of that. You saw more screens uh, the last game or two that we've been playing uh, than what we did before. We never saw screens, uh, bubble screens, receiver screens, uh, any of that stuff uh, before. I do think that, uh, I mean, we saw the bone, the double wishbone bone package today. I, I'm going to call that the T-bone because that, uh, <laughs> that was a lot of meat. Uh, but, uh, yeah, see, I got a funny in there. Yeah, uh, but, it, but, uh, but yeah, I, I do see some variability in what he's doing. I still think we need to use the middle of the field when people are, are rushing us. We need to be open up that middle of the field. We did that a little bit against ECU, but we need to continue to develop that side of our game. So do I think it's predictable? I think we're trading speed, um, uh, speed and we're also banking on our uh, speed for our players. So our skill players are going to out either muscle or out hustle you. And the fact that we're running so fast is going to make you make us out condition you. You see that in third quarters. So yes, do I think it is more uh, predictable, especially when compared to like something as complex as frost offense that used uh, different facets to do that? Yes, but we also move a lot faster. So you're wearing them out. We're getting more possessions. And as I mentioned before, we we had more possessions of what they did. We just didn't uh, we didn't execute on them and get to that fifty two percent level. Some of that is the defense. Some of it was Dylan had an off day. Clearly, our offensive lineman had an off day. So I don't think it's I think it's predictable and and I think it's predictable because uh, of the offense we're trying to trying to. Uh, run and the strategy of speed kills. So I don't necessarily think it's a problem. I think it's by design. Can this team bounce back against Memphis? 100% it can, but it's got to take a long, hard look in the mirror and decide what the hell they want to be. There was a lot of anger after they were walking off the field. They didn't shake hands. Apparently there was some waving and some people took umbrage to the fact that the Tulsa players were taking a picture on our 50 yard line. Uh, logo uh, and there were some heated exchanges going on there and, and holding some people back so what they need to do is take that energy channel that energy focus on what they're doing focus on fundamentals this week and go beat their uh i was going to say something uh <laughs> tushes yeah. uh next week and tame that tiger well two weeks but yeah, absolutely. I agree with with that. And and hey, everybody, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate it. I know that this week was hard uh, for a lot of people. It's definitely hard for me. You can usually tell uh, my tone of voice how I feel. So, 
All righty. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your questions. And now, news and notes from the world of UCF sports. All right, no new news and notes, really, uh, to talk about. But I'm going to use this space to talk about some of our guys in the NFL. Uh, The NFL watch list. Latavius Murray, 14 for 64 and two touchdowns. Uh, Traquan Smith, four for 54 and two touchdowns. So that was a good day for the Saints. Brashad Perryman was out. Shaquille Griffin, two straight games with an interception. Matt Prater, uh, three for three on extra points, did not kick any field goals this week or or even chances for field goals. Uh, Jordan Aikens out. And then our guy, Gabe Davis, uh, playing for the Buffalo Bills. He had, I did not completely update, only one reception, but 26 yards touchdown uh, was that reception. So... If that is correct, I'm not sure, Uh, because sometimes these apps that I look at are not totally correct. But I did watch the game and saw him in there quite a bit, and he scored that touchdown. So uh, He's doing really well and killing it. I mean, uh, you know, everybody, we were a little concerned when he got drafted where he was, and I'm also glad to see Trey Quansmith getting some some snaps because there was some concern about that as well. Yeah, and we got Adrian Killens playing right now as we speak in this game on Sunday night football as well. So uh, we could have news about that at some point as well. So that's I think it's awesome that he is off of the practice squad and back on the regular uh, squad for at least this week. I'm not sure how many times they take them on and off and all that stuff it just depends. So, all righty. Thank you for listening. This has been Nightline 239. I'm Andrew Fegley. And I'm Roger Phipps. Go Knights. Charge on. Victory is our cry, P-S-E-T-O-R-Y, two Niner Knights will shine.